Hello everybody, welcome to this YouTube channel Forensic Hunt. In this video, I am going to tell you about the body fluid urine, that is, how is it used as an evidence, what are its components or you can say compositions, and what are the various tests that could be used to identify these components. So first of all, I'll start with the urine as an evidence. So it could be used as an evidence in the case of asphyxial death. What is asphyxia? Asphyxia or asphyxiation is a condition of deficient supply of oxygen to the body that arises from abnormal breathing. These abnormal breathing could be in the case of a ligature like as in the case of hanging or in manual strangulation. The identification of urine stains can aid in the identification of homicides involving either ligature or manual strangulation. In these incidents, strangulation victim often involuntary excrete urine prior to death. So the location of these urine stain at the crime scene provide useful information to determine the site where the violence has occurred. At times, such evidence is also prevalent in sexual assaults and harassment cases. Now, I'm going to tell you what are the different components of the urine. In the urine, the major quantity is of the water itself. That is 95% of the urine is composed of water. The other components cover around 5%. That is the organic molecule, iron and salt, protein, and uh, leukocytes and epithelial cells. So organic compounds which are present in the urine are like urea, creatinine, uric acid, carbs, enzymes, fatty acids, hormones, pigments and mucins. Among all these organic molecules, the abundant amount which is present in urine is of urea and creatinine. So if you say ions, so it is composed of chloride, sodium, potassium, certain proteins are present and certain cells are also present. Other components also include glucose, ketone, bilirubin, urobilinogen, indican, etc. Now I'm going to tell you about the identification method of the urine. So identification could be done based upon the physical properties or chemical constituents. So, if you go with the physical property, the first physical property of the urine is its fluorescence. That is, it used to fluoresce. So, whenever you have a suspicion, whether the given sample is urine or not, what you have to do is, you have to uh, take the sample under alternate light source and it used to fluoresce. But, there is an exception. When the sample would be diluted, it's harder to detect. Generally, whenever you go with the fluorescence test for any of the body fluid, it is suggested to dry it prior to examination for the fluorescence. But there is an exception in case of urine. Why? Because depending on the compositions and the quantity of nutrient intake, certain compounds could be expelled which fluorescence in their liquid state itself. Okay, so for the fluorescence test, you can take the sample in the liquid state itself instead of drying it off before going for the fluorescence test. So the next test is the order. The order of urine is other characteristic feature and it is recommended uh, followed by gentle heating. Now, if you go with the chemical test, historically, identification of urine relied on identifying inorganic ions or organic compounds present in urine. Nowadays, urine detection relies on the identification of two organic compounds which are urea and creatinine and one inorganic compound which is indicated. So, the respective tests are there for the identification of these components. So, urea is present in high level approximately 1400 to 3500 mg per 100 ml in urine. Creatinine is present at about one tenth of these values with an average concentration of 105 to 210 mg per 100 ml. And indican is present uh, at a concentration of 3.5 to 14 mg per 100 ml. 
These all compounds are also present in other polyfluids like sweat, blood, saliva, and semen, but their concentration is quite low as compared to urine. So one by one, I'm going to cover all these tests that can be done for the examination of urea, creatinine, and indican in urine. So the first test that could be done is for the test of urea. So what is urea? Urea is a carbamide which is discovered in 1773 and it is also synthesized in 1828. So it is formed in the liver as a product of protein degradation and it is excreted by kidney in urine. So if you go with the test, the first test that you could go for its identification is Gies method. Why is it called as Gies method? Because the scientists who have invented this method, the name of the scientist is Gies. So it is also uh, called as urea nitrate crystal test based upon the reaction which is taking place in this test. So you have to take the sample along with the concentrated nitric acid and it leads to the formation of a crystal which is hexagonal crystal. These hexagonal crystals are of urea nitrate. So if your sample contains urea, so urea is going to link with the nitric acid to form urea nitrate. If you go with this procedure, what you have to do is you have to take an aqueous extract of the stain and then a thin film made on a slide. To that, you have to add one drop of concentrated nitric acid and cover it with cover slip. And now you have to simply observe under microscope. On the presence of a urea, hexagonal stack crystal of urea nitrate are formed. So this is simple. So these are the kind of crystals that you would observe under microscope. The next test that you can go for the examination of urea is DMAC test. So DMAC is a molecule which is para-dimethyl amino cinnamaldehyde. So what you have to do is, again it's very simple, you have to take the sample along with the DMAC and there would be a production of a pink or magenta color. Okay, so if you go with this procedure, you have to transfer the sample to the wet filter paper containing DMAC solution. Wrap it in an aluminium foil and let it sit overnight and observe under 473 to 548 nanometer wavelength light source or under such wavelength filter. So you will observe pink or magenta color uh, which is due to the presence of urea in the sample. The next test which you can go for is based upon the urea specific test that is based upon the urease activity. So here it is a combination of the two tests that is first of all you have to react your sample with the urease enzyme then whatever the product is formed in this reaction you have to perform the other test to know whether this product has been formed or not. So first of all as I told you it is a urease specific test first of all you should be aware that what urease is. It is an enzyme that breaks down the urea and releases ammonia and carbon dioxide. So here in this reaction you can see that once you have taken the urea and you are reacted with the enzyme then it releases carbon dioxide and ammonia. Now this ammonia is going to be detected by other tests. So the other test that could be performed after this test is the Nessler reagent test. So the ammonia, as I told you that ammonia is detected by using an indicator chemical such as Nessler's reagent. What this Nessler reagent is, it is mercuric iodide in potassium iodide. Here you can see it is mercuric iodide in the potassium iodide. How this Nessler reagent is prepared? It is very simple. You have to mix 2 gram of potassium iodide in 5 ml of water. To this solution, you have to take 3 gram of mercuric iodide and then the resulting solution is made to 20 ml. Finally, 40 gram of potassium hydroxide is added to make it alkaline base.
so you can just add while preparing the uh, nestle reagent you can add the potassium hydroxide at that point of time or you can add later on while doing uh, performing the experiment so it's your choice so once you have prepared the nestle reagent you have to take the product of this test which you have performed earlier and then you have to react both things and then what it will happen the solution will become deep yellow in the presence of ammonia until a brown precipitate is formed so the presence of brown precipitate will indirectly shows that the sample contains urea so this brown precipitate is the iodide of millions base or amido iodo mercury so the next test that you can go to know the presence of urea is again one more uh, urea specific test so it is used for the clinical detection of urea in blood or urine so here you are using a strip which is a commercial strip called as azostase so this test also relies on the same principle as you have studied in the nestle reagent test except it measures a shift in ph caused by the formation of ammonia so the first test will remain same you have to take the urea you have to react with urease again the same product is formed but as the ammonia is formed so ammonia as i you already know it is alkaline in nature so it is going to change the ph so based upon the Uh, amount of the change in the ph you will get to know the amount of urea which was present in the sample okay so you can say that it also relies on the use of urease uh, enzyme that used to break down the urea and releases ammonia and carbon dioxide then this ammonia is detected by using an azostase which is a commercial strip so this one is very easy so you have already studied four test for the urea the first test was the gies urea test the other test was the dmac test the third test was the nestle reagent test and the fourth one is the azostase test now we are going to proceed with the test of cretinin so here is the test of cretinin first of all you should be aware that what cretinin is cretinin is a waste product produced by muscles from the breakdown of a compound called cretin cretinin is removed from the body by the kidneys which filter almost all of it from the blood and releases into the urine okay so if you go with the test so the first test that you can go for the cretinin is chaffey's test again this test is also named based upon the name of the scientist who have invented this okay so this test is again very easy you have to take the sample along with picric acid and provide an alkaline medium by mixing sodium hydroxide so it will lead to the formation of a brown orange or red color complex okay and this is cretinin picrate so if you go with the procedure you have to take a drop of the stain extract on a filter paper add one drop of picric acid followed by one drop of 5% sodium hydroxide it will result in the formation of a cretinin picrate which is a bright red or brown or orange color complex that shows the presence of cretinin picrate the next test you can go for the identification of cretinin is the selkowski test here it is very simple test you have to take the sample along with sodium nitroprusside and once you are going to heat it it is going to produce a complex of prussian blue color so the formation of this prussian blue color complex shows the uh, presence of cretinin in the sample the other test uh, that could be done for the urine sample is the indican test first of all i would like to again tell you about the indican that what is indican indican is a molecule which is 3 indoxy sulfuric acid and in 1920 it is suggested by lettes for urine identification so indican is an indole produced when bacteria in the intestine act on the amino acid tryptophan as you must be aware that most indoles are excreted in the feces the remainder is absorbed metabolized 
by the liver and excreted as indican in the urine. Normally, only a small amount of indican is present in urine, but the amount of urine indican increases with high protein diets or inefficient protein digestion. If protein is not digested adequately, bacteria act on the protein causing putrefaction in colon and leads to the production of indoles which are absorbed and converted in the liver to indican. So if you go with the indican test it is very simple you have to take the sample and to that you have to add resorcinone and copper bromide and it will lead to the formation of a red color complex. So this red color complex shows the presence of indican in the sample. But this test is not specific to the urine stains as I have already told you that this compound is majorly present in the feces. The next test that you can go for the urine sample is the DNA typing. But the pre-request for the DNA typing to take place is the cells. So the cells must be there. As I have already told you that urine is primarily comprised of water and salts. Some cellular content comes from the epithelial cells washed from the urinary tract along with RBCs and WBCs. Urine stains are very dilute and have a very low cell concentration. Thus, the likelihood of successful DNA analysis is very low. Uh, one factor which uh, restricts the DNA typing is the low content of these cells. The other factor is the presence of bacterial content. So the bacterial content of urine may also hinder DNA analysis through degradation. So these are the references from where I have taken the material and uh, I hope all the concepts of the urine analysis are cleared by this video. If you have liked this video then please subscribe, share and like this channel and please don't forget to press the bell icon button for further notifications.